Welcome to the Clubby Podcast, episode five. I am your friendly neighborhood clubhouse attendant, Greg Larson. And in this episode, as we're walking along the green belt in Austin, Texas, next to Barton Creek, this episode, I wanna to talk to you guys about host families and the sort of living situations that minor league baseball players have. Um, because it is quite unusual when you think about it. A minor league baseball player is somebody who's gonna be moving around a lot. So a lot of these guys, you know, some of these guys, they get drafted at 18. Um, if you're an international signing, you could get drafted as young as 16 years old. And um, those, the interesting thing about those international signings, the guys all, quite often from the Caribbean nations, more specifically from uh, the Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic, and even more specific, I don't know why exactly, Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic is a hotbed for major league talent and minor league talent. I don't know why that city specifically. Maybe it's just one of the highest population cities. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so if a, a player gets drafted at 16, 17 out of the Dominican Republic, for example, they are not old enough to come over and play in the minors yet. What they'll do is they'll stay in the DR and they go to these academies that are um, owned and operated by the team that, that signed them. They're not drafted like a normal, uh, uh, they have unique rules that American players don't have. So they, they're not a part of the draft, for better or for worse. So, for example, let's say the Minnesota Twins sign a few players from the Dominican Republic, and the Dominican Republic on an international free agent signing. All those guys, those teenagers, will go to the same Minnesota Twins training complex in the DR. And now... This may change with COVID and with contractions and all that, but up until 2020, it was the case that, oops, boy, I'm really running through the thickets here. It was the case that those academies, I mean, man, the, some of those academies, it was like, they, they wouldn't have air conditioning in the summers. They would sometimes run out of running water. They would sometimes just be a concrete building in the middle of the Dominican Republic with nothing but a bunch of teenagers hanging out, working on their baseball skills, theoretically getting help from the academy. Um, you know, the team might provide a financial skills expert. Uh, in theory, they're, they're going to school as they're at these academies. Uh, it's all bullshit. From what I heard from those guys, there was no real training on anything other than baseball. They just say that shit, I think to appease the media, but since there's not a whole lot of media access in those academies, I think they more do it to appease the families, is my hypothesis. That a major league team can say to a 16 year old Dominican kid's family, hey, we're going to give you a bunch of money, but on top of it, you know, he's not going to miss out on his schooling, anything like that. Fucking bullshit. One, maybe the families don't even care. All they cared about was the money and, hey, more power to them. Like, it's a, it, it, you may as well be winning the lottery for a lot of those families. It's like, might be the most money they've ever seen or considered having in their entire lives. And two, oh, Jesus, these are th crazy thorns. Look at this. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you can see it, but I am stuck on it. Oh, here we go. Oh boy. Oh boy. I feel like I'm that little kid in that, that copper tone commercial, like the kid who's got the, the dog biting his pants off its ass. It's like that, except I'm a grown man. Oh Jesus, okay. Holy butterscotch. Um, 
yeah, the academies, they're not learning shit other than baseball. It's kind of like NCAA with basketball and football. Like, in theory, those kids at a D1 school are still going to class. And as they're playing, you know, they're student athletes. They're students first and athletes second. Fucking bullshit, you know? They're sitting... They have a, a class specifically designed... They have a class that's specifically designed for the athletes at those universities. They don't learn a damn thing. They have tutors that are, you know, doing their papers for them. It's all for show. Nobody's actually learning anything. Let's all stop pretending. Like, straight up. Hold on. Technical difficulties. I got nature difficulties. This is really a low budget production here. Let's all stop pretending that we're doing anything other than... It's not exploiting if you're getting paid for it, but let's stop pretending that we're doing anything other than focusing on the athletics. Okay, you are not going to put in the resources to actually teach a Dominican kid what to do as a 16-year-old with $2.2 million or whatever the hell their, their signing bonus might be. Don't pretend that you're teaching them things. But what would happen is a lot of these guys, from the Dominican in particular, they get a signing bonus. They don't know what to do with that money. Like, they've never had an opportunity to learn what to do with that, that money. And a lot of people say that the American kids are treated better than the Dominican kids uh, in the minors. And that may be true, but I never saw any evidence in my time in the Orioles organization, that there's anybody sitting any of these kids down. American, Dominican, Canadian, whatever. Nobody sat them down and said, here's how you handle the, here's how you handle finances, you know? There's none of that. And if there was, it was happening in backroom conversations. It wasn't like an institutionalized part of the, of the organization. And I never heard of any, any other organizations taking those steps either uh, but anyway I wanted to talk more about the host families so that does bring us to the the concept of host families now that it's a transient lifestyle that a minor leaguer lives they're not going to be in one spot for an entire year you know so, some kid some kid who's 19, 20, 21, who plays for the Aberdeen Ironbirds, is not going to live in Aberdeen in the offseason. He's got some girlfriend in Charlotte. He's got a wife in Cheyenne. And he's going to be there in the offseason. So during the season, they don't have a ton of money to be able to do, uh, you know, to... to double up on a, a, a lease for example you know they probably have another home base that they're living in so what they do is the minor league the the town that a minor league team is in will have people who volunteer to be host families and these host families they might be super fans they might work for the team somehow they might uh you know they might have a kid who used to be a minor league or something like that but they're often an older couple who has a spare bedroom or spare entire floor of their house. It totally depends. And they'll host a minor league player for the summer. Maybe two, maybe three. And sometimes they'll do it for free. And sometimes they'll just charge a token rent, like 10 bucks a day. And they'll take care of the players. And it's kind of a cool setup. Well, on the surface, it's really sweet, like, uh, Think, imagine your grandparents are kind of lonely in their little town that they live in and they miss seeing their grandkids and maybe they're empty nesters and they just want to house a player from the local team for the summer and gives them an opportunity to feel connected to the team. The part of it that's kind of sad is that that's a necessity, you know? Like, it's a... It's organized, you know, those relationships are organized by the team. But the team itself isn't 
helping out the players. They're just facilitating somebody else to help out the players. You see what I'm saying? Like, why would they not, why would they not put the players up in the first place? Which brings me back to myself. You know, it's like the, <laughs> it's like the most narcissistic sentence. But uh, as a clubhouse attendant, so as a clubhouse attendant, I was a, technically an employee of the minor league team, the Aberdeen Ironbirds. Whereas the players were technically em employees of the Baltimore Orioles, who were basically just, you know, uh, like, like Cal Ripken Jr. was my boss. And just because he, he owned the team. But for the players, he wasn't their boss because they were only, as employees of the Baltimore Orioles, they were only, say, renting that space. It's a, it's a strange agreement between minor league teams and major league teams. And now it's becoming more, it's, it's changing. But what it used to be was that a minor league team, the, the benefit that a minor league team was, would get is that the, their major league, their parent team, would send them high quality players to attract fans, would give them the marketing and promotional materials of being able to use the major league team's uh, logo and name associated with their stadium. And in exchange for that, the minor league team would send a percentage of ticket sales and merchandise. And the minor league team's big benefit is they'd sell advertising space. They would, you know, sell it. They'd keep their concessions money. But it's basically like they had to pay a tax to the major league team in order to have the benefit. And then the benefit that the major league team gets is pretty much everything. They get, their players get to... Um, you know, hone their skills at a highly competitive level. Um, don't have to worry about it. You know, the major league team takes care of the equipment, like the baseballs and stuff. But beyond that, you know, it's a pretty sweet gig for the major league teams. There's <laughs> so quite often. What is this? The strange things you find on the trail. This is a little uh, sundial type thing. Looks beautiful. It does look a little bit creepy, you know, with the dead flowers and stuff. It looks like something you'd find at the uh, at Midsummer, that movie. But what would, what might happen? Again, everything changes this year with the contraction and all that. But what used to happen is that a major league team would get fed up with, you know, maybe they get fed up with the facility of a minor league team and they they would feel like it wasn't a high quality enough facility to you know warrant being associated with the New York Yankees or with the Boston Red Sox. So they would end their affiliation with the team and move on somewhere else like for example the Minnesota Twins double A affiliate used to be in New Brighton and then they changed to the uh, Chattanooga Lookouts but well, there is there's one instance. The Baltimore Orioles used to be, used to have their AAA affiliate in Rochester, New York. The Rochester Red Wings were the AAA affiliate for the Baltimore Orioles for, I think, three plus decades. And finally, the Rochester Red Wings being fed up with the low level of talent that the Baltimore Orioles were sending them, the Red Wings ended their affiliation with the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, it's a very, un it's almost always the other way around. It's very uncommon. And they said, look, uh, we're, we're not happy with the low level of talent. We feel like we have a good facilities. We have good concessions. We got a good culture and atmosphere here. We're going to go onto the market and find somebody else. And sure enough, the Minnesota Twins uh, moved. Can you hear it? There's like a wind chime. This is an interesting, I don't know where I am in the forest right now. It's kind of creepy and very actually cool. I love this town, man. You just never know what you're going to find. Uh, but sure enough, the Rochester Red Wings moved to the uh, Minnesota Twins because the Red Wings fired the Orioles. 
so I was something of a <laughs> being a being an employee of the Aberdeen Ironbirds and not the Orioles. When I first started as a clubby, the Aberdeen Ironbirds had a deal with a nearby apartment complex where some of the employees of Cal Ripken Baseball and its umbrella, uh, some of the employees got to live for free, including me. So I, as, a, as the jockstrap washer and the guy who cut the oranges, the team gave me free living facilities. Whereas the players, the ones who made it all happen, who are the only reason any of those people had jobs, including me, any of the ushers, any of the people in concessions, none of us would have had anything to do if there wasn't a baseball game to watch on the field. And there'd be no baseball game without the players. I got free living. So what I did is I became something of a uh, surrogate host family. So I, the team, they gave me a two bedroom apartment for free. And obviously at the time I wasn't complaining, but it's just like, man, this feels a little bit backwards. And so I had one player stay with me almost the entire summer, Sam Kimmel. But at any given time, you know, I, I would just tell guys, I told Sam, I was like, look, if there's anybody who can't find a host family, uh, you know, is, is only here for a couple months, whatever, tell them they can stay in my place. At any given time, I'd have between three and five players staying in my two-bedroom apartment. And not once did we have any living room furniture. At no point did anybody take the second bedroom for some reason. I think they were just kind of shy about it. And, I mean, I, I would walk in. And mind you, you know, I would get done my day would end a lot later than theirs because I'd be in the uh, clubhouse doing laundry and stuff. But I would get done, come home, and I'd be stepping over like new bodies. I'd be like, oh, the, you know, there's a new draft pick guy who just got moved up from the Gulf Coast League is sleeping in the corner on a blow-up mattress. There'd just be a, a blow-up mattress and a little nest of clothes and uh, backpack just in each corner of the living room. And we never had anything in the fridge but a little bit of beer and... <laughs> I, I was on a blow-up mattress. Like, when I think about minor league baseball, I think about blow-up mattresses, man. Like, that's half of it. That's half of the journey right there is just sleeping on a blow-up mattress for a couple months. And I honestly, like, I would have charged the guys rent, and I didn't refrain. I, I refrained from charging rent, not because I was a good person or because I felt guilty, but just because I didn't have the balls to do it, you know? That's what I remember. And I had my own blow-up mattress in my uh, bedroom at that apartment. But then year two starts. And Ripken Baseball is starting to lose money. Almost every department was in the red and um, my old boss, well, my new boss, who is the GM, he said that the uh, Ripken front office with the Aberdeen Ironbirds was ending their agreement with the apartment complex. What is this, a sewer? Is that an old tire? It's pretty stable. I mean, look at this flat rock here. This is incredible. And the houses here, man. I love Texas because nobody gives a F word about anything. These houses are just hanging off the edge of a cliff, like built in. There's like no regulations about anything. <laughs> just right into this limestone, soft. Uh, I was going to say wood. Limestone is probably like stone, right? They tell me we're not going to put you up in an apartment anymore. Uh, nobody's going to be in an apartment you still interested? I said, screw it, dude. I'm still in. What I did was I just lived in the equipment closet. And now, now mind you, the clubhouse has air conditioning, has refrigerators, it has showers, it has internet connection. It has everything you really need. Uh, it's lacking quite a bit for windows though, you know, like it was one of those things where, 
at no point did I feel fully s safe isn't the right word, but fully private or anything because there are multiple people had keys to the equipment closet. So let's say it was an off day and the team was on the road and I was just sleeping. I was sleeping in, you know, the groundskeeper, he might just walk in in the middle of the morning to grab something just because it was the equipment closet. Maybe he needed to grab some baseballs or something or some pants, whatever it may be. It was, um, I mean, the feeling of going in that second season, you know, I, I was a clubby for two seasons. That first season, it was an adventure, and I was going to my new apartment, and I, it was my first job out of college, and, and who knows what's going to happen. I'm part of professional baseball. The veneer had worn off by the second season, and I was back because I just had no other choice. You know, the gravitational pull of the game was just too strong for me to deny, and I had no other job experience, so I said, screw it, dude, I'm going back. I'm going back because I just don't have a choice, is how it felt. Now, give me a second. I'm navigating some interesting... Oh, I was going to say tapestry, but the word is topography. So I go back because I have to. My relationship at the time... You know, my girlfriend and I, we have a lease in South Carolina. So I was paying half the rent there and trying to make money over the summer so I was not about to pay two rents and when you drive up you know that long drive from South Carolina to Maryland and I arrive at the stadium and the reality hits me like I am going to be living in a closet for the summer you know it makes you question whether or not you're going to get out of this thing with your sanity intact and I nested in there as much as I could. I, But that first night when I was in the equipment closet and that smell of rosin hit me. Something about that licorice smell of, of rosin powder that lingered in the air. It was one of those smells that it's almost, it's so chemical, but it's also so natural, you know? It's almost, it's a shocking smell. It's, it's like this electric licorice smell and taste. It's like so strong that you can actually taste it into the back of your sinuses. It's one of those smells that you get used to it as you play baseball and you kind of, or as you are around the game even. And you stop noticing it's there. But once you disappear, leave for the off season and come back, it's just a shocking attack of a smell and when i went into the equipment closet and i smelt that again i almost had a full-on panic attack i mean i've had panic attacks since so i know it wasn't a complete panic attack but it was it was so overwhelming to blow up my air mattress to smell that smell and lay down for the night in that equipment closet and think i'm gonna stay here for a full summer and i don't know what's gonna happen but it became home dude for better and for worse, that closet became my home. And it allowed me to take more ownership over my role and over the clubhouse because it was literally my bedroom and my living room. And I, f I feel like it made me better at my job. I certainly wouldn't do it again. Yeah, and players, they just travel light in the summer, you know? Oof. Because they don't know if they're going to get moved up. They don't know if they're going to get released. And so they have like mail just trailing them around the country. And they're breaking leases. They don't have... They can't really settle down and feel comfortable anywhere. And granted, at single A, you don't want to feel comfortable there. I remember at the beginning of that second year, it was gear up day. So all the players were coming to the bedroom, aka the equipment closet, and getting their gear. And I heard Tim, the catcher, draft pick out of Stetson University in Florida my old roommate I hear him talking about having a conversation with one of the people in the front office who said I bet you're happy to be back and his response was this is single a I don't want to be here and you know that's another one of those disconnects where the front office people they're like well this is the best place 
this is my favorite place in the world. Why would anyone want to be anywhere else? And the players were like, yo, this is short season single A. The entire reasoning for my existence is to move on up from here. I don't want to be back here. You know, if you're in short season single A for two years, something's, something's fishy. Uh, you're, not, you're not on the fast track if you're in short season single A for two years. So that's a little bit about host families, a little bit about what it's like to live in minor league baseball. That's been episode five of the Clubby Podcast. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood clubhouse attendant, Greg Larson, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.